welcome back uh, to Theology with Puppies. Again, if you like this material, please like, share, and subscribe. We're going to be doing things a little bit differently today. As you see, I am without a puppy. Uh, the video will be uh, probably up quite a bit longer than usual. Uh, I'm going to be addressing <clears throat> uh, a, a pretty serious Trinitarian error that the one and the many is the Trinity. I was concerned when I first heard this uh, from Dyer, and I was concerned about where it was coming from. I know that this is not a patristic thing at all. And so in this video, we are going to be looking at where he gets this from, because it is from outside orthodoxy. And then <clears throat> what is the patristic way of addressing the Trinity? Okay. And we'll look through a number of fathers to do so. So when he was first saying that there was the one and the many in the Trinity, uh, I went looking at his reading list of what he's recommending. So I think what's uh, <clears throat> interesting to point out about his reading list is that, yes, it does have fathers, it, it does have uh, orthodox authors on it, but it also has a number of non-orthodox writers, particularly in the biblical theology section, James Jordan, David Chilton, Ken Gentry, and Milton Terry. Those are the five. Those are the four names mentioned. None of whom are orthodox, and those are the only only names that are mentioned under biblical theology um, under his recommended reading list. I think that's that's concerning. Uh, but in reading his, in looking, perusing his reading list, I noticed a book by, by A. R. J. Rush Dooney named The One and the Many. And this caught my attention because I figured I theorize that this is probably where he is getting this material. So first, who is R.J. Rush Dooney? I didn't know before looking into this. I don't come from Calvinist backgrounds. I grew up in a Lutheran family and then converted through Anglo-Catholicism into Orthodoxy, uh, mainly just through singing in church choirs. <clears throat> uh, R.J. Rush Dooney was a Calvinist philosopher. He lived from uh, 1916 until 2001, a Calvinist philosopher, history, and theologian. So already we are in dire straits, so to speak. And is widely credited as being the father of Christian Reconstructionism and an inspiration for the modern Christian homeschool movement. Okay. Uh, I think, just kind of on a comical note, uh, Dyer likes to call how Calvinists and Protestants are Nestorian, and R.J. Rush Dooney created a foundation called the Chalcedon Foundation. I think that that is, uh, for me, that's a little comical. <clears throat> and uh, he obtained support of major Christian book publishers and endorsements from influential, influential evangelical leaders, including Pat Robertson, Jerry Falwell, and our Frank Schaefer, who has his own problematic history in the North, through the Orthodox Church. So he wrote this book called The One and the Many. And I bought this book on Kindle. It was $7. Uh, and it is primarily filled with the, the normal uh, 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s uh, right <clears throat> uh, evangelical right proclutching of freedom and the state and uh, social economic issues and geopolitical issues uh, regarding uh, freedom of religion in the state and what the position of the state is. And then using, using the one and the many as a way of articulating his particular political views. I didn't find the book to be uh, all that inspiring. <clears throat> and in fact, right at the beginning, there are horrendous errors, particularly regarding the one and the many, his understanding of the one and the many. So, in his first chapter, he discusses the problem <clears throat> of the one and the many, okay? So, uh, on my page two of Kindle, he writes, The avoidance of the problem makes necessary a few elementary definitions as a prelude to a discussion. The one refers not to a number, but to unity and oneness. In Excuse me. In metaphysics, it has usually meant the absolute, the supreme idea for Plato, the universe for Parmenides, being as such for Plotinus, and so on. The one can be a separate whole, or it can be the sum of things in their analytic or synthetic wholeness, that is, 
It can be trans it can be a transcendent one, which is the ground of all being, or it can be an imminent one. This entire paragraph is wrong, actually. Uh, it is questionable whether Parmenides even believed in a universe whatsoever. Being as such for Plotinus is not one. Okay. Uh, the the this is extremely misunderstood about Plotinus, mainly because they are reading Rist, and Rist gets Plotinus horrendously wrong, because no one is actually reading the primary text. For Plotinus, the one is nothing at all. You can't even name it the one, because the one is to give it some kind of, of predication, and therefore it is no longer the one. I'm reminded of the Lao Tzu text, uh, the Tao Te Ching, when it says the one that can be named is not the Tao, the Tao that can be heard is not the Tao, the Tao that can be touched is not the Tao, okay? So again, for Plotinus, the one is not being as such. Okay, this is, this is already problematic. Rush Duny goes on, the one can be a separate whole. No. This, uh, this issue of separation and wholeness uh, necessitates parts. Okay, the one is not made of parts. Uh, I think there's a, a really good ex uh, usage uh, analogy of, uh, of a car. A car is made of parts, but the car is not the sum total of those parts. It is beyond the sum total of those parts. And so no matter, <clears throat> for the one, no, no matter how many finite things you put together, you can never make the infinite. It will always be contained within the infinite. So the one is not made of parts. God is not made of parts. Essence and energies, the essence and energy distinction is not, they are not parts of God. This is, this is a big, a big confusion. And it's definitely not the one can be a separate whole. A, right? It's not a anything. And it's not separate. It's definitely not whole. Or it can be the sum of things in their analytic or synthetic wholeness. Again, that is, that is just nonsense. That is, it can be a transcendent one, which is the ground of all being. So that's fine. Or it can be an imminent one. The problem here is that he says, or it can be an imminent one. Now, the issue of utter transcendence is that it requires utter imminence, and utter imminence requires utter transcendence because the one is not more here than it is there. It is everywhere, and so it is at both times, in all places, and nowhere at all. So this is the groundwork um, with which Rush Dooney continues his his contemplation of the one and the many, and, and then tries to supposedly solve this. <clears throat> Again, he doesn't he clearly is not going to the primary text. But later on in the first chapter, he talks about how the 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 Trinitary, the Trinitarian doctrine in Christianity is the so-called solution to the one and the many. Here he quotes Van Til, another Reformed thinker. This is Van Til. Using the language of the one and many question, we contend that in God the one and many are equally ultimate. Unity in God is no more fundamental than diversity, and diversity in God is no more fundamental than unity. The persons of the Trinity are mutually exhausted of one, of one another. The Son and the Spirit are ontologically on par with the Father. It is a well-known fact that all heresies in the history of the Church have in some form or other taught subordinationism, Similarly, we believe all heresies and apologetic methodologies spring from some form of subordinationism. This paragraph is entirely incompatible with the Orthodox faith. Unity and, and diversity are not equal. They are not coextensive. There is no father who would say that. <clears throat> uh, unity is much more fundamental than diversity. So they are, they are not equally ultimate. That is absurd. Uh, there are no, <coughs> uh, again, this is proven by the fact that for, uh, for orthodoxy, let me just pull it up here. The fathers worked hard to reject accusations of plurality in God, insisting not only that the divine nature is, is one, i.e. not many, but that the Trinity has its basis in the single person of the Father, the monarchy of the Father and that there are not a plurality of principles in God. When the Father spoke about the one and the many, they did so with reference to the Church and the Divine Eucharist. And that's 1 Corinthians 10, 17. So <clears throat> we're going to continue to discuss 
this. Right? I mean, Dyer has 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 obsessively talked about how the one and the many in the Trinity uh, insisting that God is both one and many. But this this is very problematic. I'm going to go back to the the page from Rush Dimmy's book. There's, there are some other issues here. This is Rush Dooney. Thus, all factuality in the universe is created and understandable only in terms of the ontological trinity. Now we've talked about we talked about the difference between logical and ontological, right? So at least Rush Dooney admits that we can talk about uh, something based in ontology. So I'm I'm happy to see him say that. But would he let me go on and you'll see the problems. Because he created it, that is the universe, its meaning is also created meaning. That would mean that the Logi are created. Okay? The Logi are uncreated. So, very problematic. <clears throat> Derived from him who made it. This points us to the ontological trinity as the answer to the problem of the one and the many. Immediately we have a distinction which does not exist in non-Christian thought. We have a temporal one and many in the created universe, and we have an eternal one and many in the ontological trinity in absolute and self-complete unity. No. No, this is wholly unorthodox. <coughs> we uh, absolutely, there is no way to say that the meaning of the universe, the meaning of creation is created. That, that is absurd. And the fact that this book is being promoted by <clears throat> so-called guardians and champions of orthodoxy uh, is absurd. I mean, this is simply um, importing non-orthodox thought and then trying to co-opt it in, in, into the fathers. Okay. But what do the fathers say? Let's see what the fathers have actually written. This is St. Basil. The unapproachable one is beyond numbers. Count if you must, but do not malign the truth. Either honor him who cannot be described with your silence, or number holy things in accord with true religion. There is one God and Father, one only begotten Son, and one Holy Spirit. We declare each person to be unique, and if we must use numbers, we will not let a stupid arithmetic lead us astray to the idea of many gods. So again... The persons of the Trinity are not multiple. Okay, and we're gonna. This is going to be important. We're going to get into this in a little bit. We we'll go through Nyssa and Maximus. This is Saint Hilary of Poitiers in De Trinitate. The title messenger proves that he has an office of his own. That his nature is truly divine is proved when he is called God. But this sequence, first angel, then God, is in the order of revelation, not in himself. For we confess them Father and Son in the strictest sense, in such equality that the only begotten Son, by virtue of his birth, possesses true divinity from the unbegotten Father. This revelation of them as sender and as sent is but another expression for Father and Son, not contradicting the true divine nature of the Son, nor canceling his possession of the Godhead as his birthright. For none can doubt that the Son by his birth partakes of the nature of his author in such, a, in such wise that from the one there comes to being an indivisible unity, because one is from one. So again, indivisible unity. Okay. <clears throat> St. Hilary continues, We see how the living Son of the living Father, he who is God from God, reveals the unity of the divine nature, indissolubly one and the same, and the mystery of his birth in these words, I and the Father are one. Okay. <clears throat> this, is, this part is important also from St. Hilary. When Israel hears that its God is one, and that no second God is likened, that men may, dream, may deem him God, to God, who is God's Son, the revelation means that God the Father and God the Son are one altogether, not by confusion of person, but by unity of substance. For the prophet forbids us, because God the Son is God, to liken him to a second deity. And again, the one is from the other. They are two, they, and they too are a unity. Not two made one, yet one in the other. 
for that which is both is the same. There's a longer quote here, which I will just look at, <clears throat> where he says that there is no duality. There is no duality in God, that the Son and the Father do not form a duality. That's section 8 from book 1 of De Trinitate. And then we have, <clears throat> let me find it, St. Gregory of Nyssa, not three gods. For then every good thing and every good name, depending on that power and purpose which is without beginning, is brought to perfection in the power of the Spirit through the only begotten God, without mark of time or distinction, since there is no delay existent or conceived in the motion of the divine will from the Father to the Son to the Spirit. And if Godhead also is one of good names and concepts, it would not be proper to divide the name into a plurality. Since the unity existing in the action pre prevents plural enumeration. So we cannot say that there is plurality in the Godhead. There is no many. And as the Savior of all men, especially of them that, that believe, is spoken of by the Apostle as one, and no one from this phrase argues either that the Son that does not save them who believe, or, this, or that salvation is given to those who receive it without the intervention of the Spirit. But God, who is over all, is the Savior of all. While the Son works salvation by means of the grace of the Spirit, and yet they are not on this account called in Scripture three saviors. So neither are they called three gods, according to, this, to the signification assigned to the term Godhead, even though the, afore, the aforesaid appellation attaches to the Holy Trinity. This is important. You can conceive in, in, your, in your imagination plurality, but the, there is no plurality. It does not seem to me absolutely necessary with a view of the present proof of our argument to contend against those who oppose us with the, ass with the assertion that we not to conceive Godhead as an operation. For we, believing the divine nature to be unlimited and incomprehensible, conceive no comprehension of it, but declare that the nature is to be conceived in all respects as infinite, and that which is absolutely infinite is not limited in one respect, while it is left unlimited in another. Again, there are no parts. Parts are limited. The, the infinite is not, a, is not a, the summation of finite parts. St. Gregory continues, <clears throat> But infinity is free from limitation altogether. That therefore which is without limit is surely not limited even by name. In order then to mark the constancy of our conception of infinity in the case of the divine nature, we say that the deity is above every name, and Godhead is a name. Now it cannot be that the same thing should be at once be a name and be accounted as above every name. Now again, he is saying how Godhead is the operation. And the operation is wholly singular. Okay? There is no plurality in the operation of God. Again, there is one energy. There is one operation because there is one God. There is not many. So St. Gregory hits on a lot of <clears throat> a lot of issues here from, from J. Dyer. A lot of confusion, a lot of errors. But I will continue, because I'm sure this next part he thinks he has some kind of defense. But if it pleases our advers adversaries to say that the significance of the term is not operation but nature, we shall fall back upon our, origi our original argument that custom applies the name of a nature to denote multitude erroneously. Again, when you see many men in a room, you, there was one man there because there was one nature. To call them many men is erroneous. Since according to true reasoning, neither diminution nor increase attaches to any nature. That is, when you add or subtract men when they are born or when they die, there is no addition or subtraction from the nature, from human nature. For it is only those things which are contemplated in their individual circumscription which are enumerated by way of addition. Okay, so I'm sure that at this point he would say, well, we can, we can think of the three hypotheses of God. This is not true. This is, this is, again, extremely shallow thinking. And let me find St. Maximus the Confessor, 
This is 200 centuries on the theology of the sun. Second century, number one, all the way at the bottom. It's quite long, so I won't read the whole thing. The essence, power, and energy of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. For none of the hypotheses or persons either exists or is intelligible without the others. You cannot intellect the Logos apart from the Father and the Spirit because they are not plural. There is no plurality there. There is no multiplicity there. You notice also, St. Maximus says that the energy is one. There are not many energies. <clears throat> I want to also add before I end that in the, Greg, in the Hillary quotes in De Trinitate, he continually refers to the Father as unbegotten. This is the correct term for, for the Father's hypostatic quality, not unoriginate. So the fact that he, at one point, J. Dyer said that the, that the Son is un unoriginate because the Father is, is, is uh, also erroneous and shallow thinking. The term is unbegotten, begotten, and procession. Those are the hypostatic qualities, all of which are unoriginate. The, the, the persons of the Trinity and the divinity are all unoriginate. Okay? So, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know what to say. Uh, it's just strange and unorthodox sounding formulation about the one and the many. Dyer is uh, just, uh, he's importing speculations of, of minor figures. From the, from the American Dutch Reformed theological system. R.D. Rushdoony is not orthodox. He is a Reformed thinker. And no father would ever say that the one of the many is in the Trinity. So he's importing thought forms of heterodoxy and trying to co-opt them as orthodox. And unfortunately, people are falling for it. This is very, very, very problematic. So far from being some guardian or a champion of orthodoxy, he, he's quite adulterous with our theology, mixing it with uh, heretical views from the Reformed. So video, this video is a little bit more serious than normal. A lot of quotes, I will drop them down in the bottom of the video. The one and the many, it's, it's a reform, the, the idea of the one and the many in the, in the Trinity, or as the Trinity, is not orthodox. It is wholly reformed, and it is wholly unorthodox and incompatible with our theology and with the true and the true faith. Do not be deceived. I'll come back later with a video with puppies. Sorry that this was so heavy. Take care. <laughs>